Yeah, we got good. All the time. Okay, we'll go ahead and start. We'll start singing with the six gun. Watching in. And Mark. <laughs> That's the children's church. That's right. Big God is good. All the time. God is good. That's all I'm saying. I love this. Earth is preparing for war. Heaven is preparing for a wedding. We know that. We're well ahead of what's going on in the world. The world has lost its absolute mind. And uh, uh, here it is. We know what's going on. So we, we already know what's going on. We know how it's going to end. Amen. That's the cool thing. We know how it's going to end. Y'all repeat this with me. Spiritual warfare is 10% Satan's tactics, 90% how we respond. Remember, with God, we are not helpless. We are not hopeless. But we are power. Give the Lord a hand clap. Oh, praise. All right, one more time. Ready? These are the two most important hours of our week that we can cherish them. I'm here today to worship, not to be entertained. I'm singing to an audience of one, except my worship, oh Lord. I don't know if I saw Mighty Army this morning, but Mighty Army, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, okay, let me see it's, uh, hold on just a second. Wait a second, let me get her up here. Technology is wonderful. See, but it works when you know how to work it. There's two parts to that. Alright, look at this, this, this is my army this morning. Because I, 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 I couldn't decide which word to use. The more we pray during times of peace, the less we bleed during times of battle. Okay? Actually, I should have put the more we prepare. Prepare. During times of peace, the less we bleed during times of battle. And so, this is part of preparing. Because you're going to go into battle this week. It may not be with swords and spears and shields, but I promise you, you're going into battle. Some of you went into battle on the way here today. And so it's important that when things are when things don't seem to be going so Tough. That's what we seem to push God to the side. Pull it to you. Or pull up to Him. Amen. Because God's got something special for every last one of us. Alright, ready? Y'all ready to worship? We still have a lot of sick, but we'll talk about that in just a minute. Pray for Israel. Not just for Israel. And pray for and all the innocent victims on both sides. We need God to stand up and show Himself strong. And we know God will. We trust Him. So here's our prayer for Israel again. Let's do this together. Say it out loud. May the Lord answer you to death trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. Salah. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. May now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with his saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. O Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. Give the Lord another hand clap for you. God is so good to us. Matter of fact, He's better to us than we are to Him. Amen. Amen. Ready? Let's sing. <laughs> I sing.
He's an old time God. He's on his time, not on our time. That's what we have our problem is. He's on his time, not our time. Amen. Amen. It's like I said, he's on his time, not our time. Amen. Amen. All right, that's, that's, that's to get your offering. If you've already put your offering in at the front, that's good. Put your hand up. If you haven't put it in yet, pick your offering up and put it in your hand. And here we go. I lift my offering to you that it please you, O oh Lord. This is my seed. I will at least my hand it will never leave my life. You will multiply except my seed, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father. Go ahead and give another praise. Can be seated. Praise the Lord. Saints. Uh, does anybody have any outspoken requests this week? Other than any special needs outspoken. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for each and everything that you've done in our lives. Thank you, God. Father, as we come again this morning, we just ask that you administer my life for each and every situation. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Lord, we live in the mouth of God. We just ask for your deliverance this morning in each and every one of these requests. Yes. Unspoken life. That you may be glorified, Lord. Yes. The Lord. Yes. And be with us in the remainder of this service. Prepare our hearts to receive your word. May it abide in my Father. And Lord, Pastor, as you've been there this morning. Lord, thank you for everything you said. In Christ Jesus' name. In church. Amen. 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 We're going to slow down a little bit. We haven't done these songs in quite a while. And so we're going to go through them. And especially what's coming up, the message is coming up. Uh, have, you, have, you, have you found yourself, especially lately, with all the things that's going on around us, have you found yourself in allowing the stuff around us to label us? Amen? To, kind of, to, to get you to think in a different perspective, and to get you in a defeated, a defeated thought or mindset, it's important that we don't let the things around us uh, outdo the God in us and the God that surrounds us over it all. Amen. And what we started is is by surrendering. Amen.
nursing homes, in hospital rooms, just right down the road. I just sing it when I'm feeling, feeling kind of overwhelmed. This is my go-to song. I love it. It's always been there for me, and I thank God for this awesome, awesome song. Ready?
I want y'all to uh, uh, be refreshed in this sermon. <laughs> Amen. You know, I did have to read this story about a man who parked his bicycle near the Capitol in Washington, D.C. And he walks on. A police officer stops him and says, Why did you park your bicycle here? Don't you know that this is a VIP road and all the congressmen and all the senators pass through here? Remember, if I don't worry about this, sir, I'll lock up my bicycle. <laughs> all right. That is good. All the time. Here we go. Here we go. Remember, there's a lot of folks in this day and time that's letting what we're going through dictate to them how they live. And they let it dictate to them how they respond to all this stuff that's going around here. So we're going to talk a little bit about circumstances, but sometimes it's not just your circumstances. Sometimes it is a circumstantial trap. It is something that we find ourselves caught up in so bad that we can no longer control it, but instead we're being controlled by our circumstances. Anybody in here, you don't have to raise your hand. Have you ever found a time in your life when you were being controlled by your circumstances? Yeah. Amen? And so God doesn't want us controlled by our circumstances. In other words, God wants us to make a difference when the circumstances are out of control. Okay? So, so, so here we go. Let's get ready. Uh, we're we're going to do a lot of reading here. So that's why I said y'all can, can sit down. I'm going to sit down too while I read. How about that? God's good. Ruth 1. If you got your Bible, turn to the book of Ruth. That's okay. Ruth chapter 1. Normally we'll we talk about Ruth. And everywhere we go through, we just think it had a whole series on Ruth. Normally that's who we focus on in this book, but not for the next two weeks. We're going to focus on Naomi. Okay? So Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. The judges were always, the judges are just like today, when everything's going good, they would forget about God. And when things got going, and when they forget about God, they would, God would allow them to have a, a evil judge and things just went downhill. They would pray to God when they saw God, God would send them a good leader and they would come back out. So the book of Judges. I call it a book of cycles. I'm not talking about bicycles. I'm not talking about motorcycles. I mean a book of cycles because everybody in our own life, we have cycles in our own life. Amen? So here it is. It came to pass in the days of the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, and this is kind of wild because Bethlehem is house of bread and Judah is praise. So even in the famine, there was a family in the house of bread and the house of praise. He, they went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephraimites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, no, 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 Naomi's husband died, and she was left and her two sons. They also took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the women, the woman survived her sons and her husband. <laughs> now remember, this is not about Ruth. Right now, this is about the So I just want to, want to pull more scripture in there. And that's verse 20. She says, Do not call me Naomi, which means sweetness, but call me Marva, which means bitter. For the Almighty has caused me great grief and bitterness. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, God, that you are alive and well on the throne, God, and that you are working miracles in our midst, Lord. And God, we know it's very easy 
to find out something the circumstance will track. And it's very easy to find the circumstances dictating to us and dictating our behavior and dictating our responses versus you dictating our responses and you dictating our behavior. One, the circumstances change us. The other, we change the circumstances. As you right now, Lord, to touch us, to breathe fresh life in everybody's life today, God. To breathe a freshness so we will know that you have been here and you have visited your people this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, Amen, amen, amen. That bottom line, do not call me Naomi, sweetness. Call me Laura, bitter. For the Almighty God has caused me grief and bitterness. Just hold that in your head for a while because that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna hover around. Let me just tell you something a little bit about uh, Naomi. And, and we'll talk more about it next week. I'll go ahead and get deeper about it next week. We're just trying to get a get a good surface started here today. Uh, here it is. Ten years Naomi was subject or subjected to the lie in Moab. Moab was cursed. They were cursed of God. It was not a place that anybody would want to be. But even though they were cursed, her husband decided who was God. His name means God is my God. God is my judge. God is in my, in my control. He leaves the house of bread and the house of praise. And he goes to a conflicted, cursed place to find his nourishment, his bread. So, 10 years then he was there. And for 10 years, she was subjected to the circumstances in Moab. This woman here, she felt, here it is, you might find this right now. She felt alone because her husband and her sons, you could say her life support, the plug was pulled. There could be somebody here today, you feel like your life support, the plug, has been poor. Well, you're still walking. You're still breathing. You're still surviving, but you're in survival mode. You're not in thriving mode. You're in survival mode because your support system, the plug, has been pulled. And when it comes to the death of her husband and her sons, the plug was violently pulled. She also only felt low. She felt abandoned because she had two daughter-in-laws. And she said, look, I'm going to go back where I came from, y'all can stay right here. One, one, one daughter says I want to stay, one says I want to go. Of course, that was Ruth. We'll get talk about it later. We're talking about Naomi. But not only was she alone, not only did she feel abandoned, circumstances altered her. Wow. I just want to stop and just chew on it. Alone, abandoned, rejected. Now all these circumstances have altered her. I've known people over the years. I pastored them. I worked with them. Who had been very bright people, jolly people, full of joy. And circumstances would happen in their life. And when circumstances happened in their life, you would find these same people. They would let circumstances get the best of them, and they would be altered, and their life would be changed for the negative forever. So, Naomi needs to be good, to be sweet, to be pleasant. Mara means to be bitter. I just want you to think about this now. Now, now look, I want you also to think about something. Those around her didn't change her name. Nobody around her said, we're going to start calling you Mara. Nobody. She said, call me Mara. Think about it. Nobody else named her that. She saw the circumstances. And when she saw the circumstances, she said, don't ever call me good and sweet. 
sweet and pleasant. I need you to call me bitter. Sometimes we get in these, in these circumstantial traps and we blame the wrong people. We blame the wrong things. Instead of the circumstances, we try to find people to lay all this blame on. So you see, she couldn't see in all this that, her, that there was a tension set on her. God was still watching her. Not only was his tension on her, he was still active in her life. And he's waiting for her to pull the trigger. He's waiting for her to leave Moab and get back to Bethlehem. He's waiting for her to quit letting circumstances dominate and dictate how she is to act. He's active, he's watching, and he's attending until she turned to him. That's a very, very, very powerful thought. Instead of blaming everybody else, God's waiting for her to put things in perspective. Jesus, or Peter, he walks on the water to Jesus. And everybody talks about him all the time. They get on him because he got under the water to sank. I think it was great that he got out of work because what was the other level? They didn't get out. He did. But he got his eyes off of Jesus and onto the circumstances. And he sank. He was doing the impossible until he started looking around and seeing what was going on. And they no longer could handle it. The disciples were Jesus in the garden. And they were there with him until they got their eyes on the circumstances. The guards coming in, taking Jesus away. They get their eyes on the circumstances, and they ran. Yeah. Circumstances kept all but one disciple from the cross. They all stayed away. Look in the Bible at how many people that circumstances keep them, hinder them, prevent them, from being used mightily at a point where they really needed to be used, they got their eyes on the circumstance versus God. And it did something. Circumstances kept the disciples behind locked doors. But Jesus got to them. They were here because they were afraid. They saw Jesus, what happened to him, and they thought that made me next. Circumstances that take his toll on Naomi. Bright, pleasant. And she goes, no, no, no. I just need you to call me Mara. Well, she just stopped to think. Go back over your life, take an inventory. Has there been times in your life when you could have really, really been used by God and you let circumstances dictate. If there's ever been a time the church does not need to let circumstances dictate to them, it's now. Watch the news, watch the anti-Semitism, I can't even say it, Semitism, and the protest, and, and watch all the people saying, don't help Israel, don't help Israel. And in a, in a country, in a world where they pride themselves on keeping people from picking on other people and beating up on other people and protecting people's rights, the whole world is saying, saying, kill them. Get rid of them. And nobody's there to protect them but just a handful. And some people are doing this because circumstances have dictated. I watched the other day. And one of the newscasters, he walked out to one of those protests, and they were talking about death to Israel and all this stuff, and and and, and uh, they, they were actually uh, uh, Hamas. They were lifting up Hamas, and so the the guy asking the reporter asking, "Why are y'all doing this?" And I said, "Well, our buddies are doing it." He said, "So 
You're for Hamas? Well, yeah, we're for Hamas. He said, so, uh, and there was even there with the, with the gay flags and stuff for Hamas. He said, do you realize that Hamas kills people that are gay? And he went, no. He said, do you realize that the women will walk around and say they kill women that try to work out? They go, no. Did you realize that they use their own people as human shields to protect their people? They went, no, we didn't know all of that. I said, so why are you out here protesting? We <laughs> watched TikTok. And we watched our professors tell us. In other words, circumstances are dictated people instead of God's word. And it's very important now that we don't take our eyes off the prize, we don't take our eyes off the target. We keep pushing and we keep trusting God. We support Israel. We keep on doing what we got to do. And we keep on pushing God and supporting Jesus and supporting Christians. Because I promise you, the day the rapture takes place, That's going to be a circumstance that some people can never get over. Amen. So now, let's watch. Let's, let's go a little bit deeper. I'm, not, I'm only getting, just getting started today. Just getting started. From the heaven of all, things are very important in the Hebrew. Very, very, <laughs> very important. Names represent first a picture of self. It's identity. I like it when I look at David in his life and, and look at his brothers. There's eight of them. Seven of them are hiding from the giant. Can't take him down, but David takes him down. And if you look at the names of all of his brothers, they're all military names. His brothers are all about spiritual warfare. It's all about all this stuff. But all this stuff, all this power, all this authority couldn't take down the giant. But David, whose name means burning love. Burning love for God took down that giant. So, picture of self identity. It also is your potential because it is a path that you go down. And also, it is a prophet of your future, your destiny. We're going to talk about it in a minute. But Jacob, after he wrestled with God, after he finally got everything together, we may talk about that next week. I don't know. After he finally got everything together, God changed his name from Jacob, which means deceiver, to Israel, which means prince with God. Prophet of the future and destiny. So yeah, think about the things that you may be around, the people that you may be around, or the circumstances that you may be in. And you may be praying for God to get you out of these circumstances, but you've got to understand something. Naomi was to be an influence in an ungodly land. We're going to be influences at our schools, be influences all these other places. You know, uh, there's people now walking out of schools because they said they don't want their walking out in the states and walkout protests, which are peaceful because they don't want guys going into girls' bathrooms. Is that too hard to ask? But because we don't want to offend anybody. Again, don't let circumstances dictate you. You go by God's word and trust God's word because I promise you really soon I mean, really soon, we're going to see something happen like this world has never seen before. And it's going to be very, very, very powerful. So instead of her influencing her environment, her environment influenced her. You can tell by the name change. So, her circumstances had her trapped. I'm, I'm getting ready to close. Getting ready. That's how I was. I'm getting ready. We're going to talk about Four things. Four things. Four ways to overcome 
a life that is beyond being caught up in a circumstantial track. We're going to go about two of them today. We'll do two of them next week because it, it gets pretty long. And we're all going to talk a little bit too while we're at it. I'm going to read this to you. Genesis 35, 16 to 19. First thing, refuse to let circumstances determine your identity. Genesis 35, 16 to 19, they journeyed to Bethel, and when they were there, a little distance to go to Ephraim, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that her, the, her, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was as her soul was departing, for she was dying. And she called his name Benoni. But the father called him Benjamin. <clears throat> so Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephraim, that is Bethlehem. Why would a man change the dying wish of his wife? Her dying wish, her last thing, was she wanted to name her son. She knew she was dying. She named him Benoni. <coughs> Jacob, who had just had an encounter with God just previously, he wrestled with God all night. God changed his name. He's, the scars are still real. He's living. But now he's no longer Jacob, the deceiver, the supplanter. He is Israel oppressed with God. He sees her name him Benoni. And he goes, No! He's me. Let's just talk a little bit about that. I am not what I'm living through, nor am I what I've already been through. Rachel got the childbirth. Name her son Benoni. Benoni means son of my sorrow. Can you imagine living life with the name son of my sorrow, knowing that your mom died in childbirth? And while she's in childbirth, she calls him son of my sorrow. I can only believe and only think about the guilt that Benoni would feel and the shame that he would feel because his mama died giving him birth. Jacob decides to make a difference. So Jacob changed his name to Benjamin, son of our right hand. Think about this. His mama called him son of my sorrow. But Benjamin said, he's a son of power. He's a son of authority. He's a son that's got a purpose and a power before him. He may have started off well, but he's going to finish well. Some of y'all be here right now. You may have been through some things that have been rough, hard. And Satan wants to get you caught in the circumstantial trap. And you can never get out of it. So I would accuse that circumstances to determine my identity. Y'all say this to me. I'm not what I'm living through. Nor am I what I've already been through. Say it with me. I'm not what I'm living through, nor am I what I've already been through. So first, refuse that circumstances determine your identity. Your present circumstances don't determine where you can go. They just merely, merely determine where you start. Wow. That's powerful. I think it all the time. All the time. Not just in the pit detention center, in the boat detention center. There's other places. I tell them all the time. This is not a stop sign. This is a speed bump. This is not a dead end. This is a fork in the road. Choose wisely. It's not your end. Actually, it is a rebirth. It is something new coming your way that God 
wants to have a part in. So, y'all going to say something to me again. Get ready. I love it. Get ready. Y'all going to say it with me. Again, say it. I'm not what I'm living through, nor am I what I've already been through. Been through. So, what are you then? What are you? I, if I'm not my circumstances, if I'm not a loser, if I'm not a, a, a victim, if I'm not following or whatever, what am I then? Get ready. I'm what my father says I am. Remember, Jacob, who had just realized the importance of a name, lived all his life as a deceiver. God changed it after an encounter in the prince with God. He does the same thing with his son. You're not going to be known son of my sorrow, but son of my right hand, not the son of somebody that, that, that calls belling, but you're going to be the son, one that rises to the occasion. So, so we're going to say this together. Get ready. Don't say this to me. I am blessed and, and highly favored. Say it with me again. I am blessed and highly favored. One more time, I love it. I am blessed and highly favored. That's what our Father says. That's not what I say. I'm not here trying to find something nice to say that sounds nice and pretty like a funeral. No, this is God's Word. Y'all say this again tomorrow when you feel like everything's falling down on top of you. You say this. I am blessed.
sometimes does that to us. It's a mirror. And to put it back in our face so we can see how it really is. We can see how God really is really working. How God has got things and how it really is. See, she's blaming God for all of her misfortunes. Don't allow the enemy to distort your vision of God. God's dealt bitter with me. He, 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 he has just hurt me. He's just, you know, and, no, 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 no. Let's, let's just go a little further here. Let's talk about the truth. The truth is, when things got rough, her family took matters in their own hands. <laughs> Have you ever taken matters in your own hands? Y'all weren't working fast enough. Y'all weren't getting it done fast enough. You didn't want to listen. This isn't always true with all the circumstances, but sometimes, in this case, her family took matters in her own hands. This was not God's doing. But it was a series of bad decisions. Wow. Not always. There's times where it's just a frontal onslaught of Satan. He's coming at you, bringing everything he's got. But then there are those times. That your decisions got you where you're at. God can help you get you out. Just remember, this is only put in here, I believe, let us know here. It's we're blaming God for everything. Sometimes you just got to look in that mirror and say, you know what, God, I could have handled this differently. I could have said it differently. I, I, I didn't have to, to beat up somebody. I just trust you, God. But even in the middle of all these bad decisions, God sent her a roof. Isn't that something? God still took care of her. She blew it, but God still took care of her. He sent her a roof. I'm getting ready to close right now. Brandon, matter of fact, you can okay, no, start getting ready to play something. Please. I love it. God, the Creator, the Holy One. Father, the sustainer, merciful, redeemer, spirit, almighty Jesus, all knowing, all forgiving, omnipotent, the beginning and the end. Refuse to let circumstances distort your view of God. This is God right here. So now, consider all Job went through. I honestly, many times, you've heard me tell you this, I've thought many times, I, now I can kind of understand Job a little better. But that night, when they put Linda on one end of the cancer center and Bethany's on the other end of the cancer center and the doctor looked me right dead in the face and said, brace yourself. You could lose one or both of them any moment. And I just swallowed big. And I went. I kissed my wife. And I kissed my daughter. And I sit on the very edge. There's a little inn at the cancer center where there's windows. And I sat there and watched the people walking back and forth. And I watched all those people. And I was telling them, see God. You got this, I know you do. But you gotta help me. And Joe came to mind. And I said, God, if you can get him through it, then what he went through. This is the closest I believe I hope the closest I'll ever come to feeling like this, but God, I really feel like Joe right now. And he came back the next day and said, There's no difference. You just do like you lose both. I thought you want some medicine. I said, no, I got some. And God, four days, I kept hearing this. You can lose either one of them. You can lose either one of them. Well, on the fourth day, my wife went home, and a few days later, my daughter, our daughter, our precious daughter, went home. My wife went to this home. Our daughter went to that home. They want to joke with her. He had a crisis in his life. A crisis in his finances, a 
crisis in his family, a crisis in his fitness, and a crisis in his faith. And his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? We always want to get beat up on her, but she went through the same thing he went through. There's a good story right there. They both went through the same thing. They both were facing the same crisis of finances, family, fitness, and faith. But they had two different views. She had circumstances. This sort of view of God said, once you curse God and die, just end it all. Get out of all this. Just end it! The joke had a different thing. He says, I know. I know my Redeemer lives. And I know in the last days we're going to be standing. Trust Him. My troubles in life do not alter who God is. Ever. The circumstances we ask God to change are often the circumstances God uses to change us. Wow. That's powerful. That's so powerful. We could read that all day long. The circumstances we're asking God to change are often the circumstances God is using to change us. This week's challenge, <clears throat> instead of asking God why, 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 I have discovered as a counselor, as a pastor, as a parent, as a friend, as a co-worker, if somebody keeps asking why, 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 they never change it to why, 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 it's because they are not allowing God to show them what he needs to show them. So, this week instead of asking why, why this? Why now? Why this, God? Why now? Why me? Have you ever done that? Think about it. You just can't, okay, I got it. You got to train yourself. Instead of asking why this, why now, why me, ask, okay, God, why are you teaching me through this now? So, well, wise, same questions are there. This, now, me. But instead of why, it's what. Instead of why are you allowing this, it's what are you teaching me through this now. If you can learn to get this in your spirit, and you can learn to be able to ask God this question, you're going to see God start to answer you in a way like never before. And something very powerful, very, very powerful is going to start happening. Once you start saying, well, what are you teaching me through this now versus why this, why now, why me? What are you teaching me through this now? You can learn to say, thank you, Father, for trusting me enough to build me, to shape me, to rub off the rough edges, to help me learn what it is like to be truly Christ-like. If you listen to these guys on television, being Christ likes walking around with a big old lot of money in your pocket, driving a great little big car, living in a great little big fancy house, I hate to tell them this, but Jesus, he didn't have a bunch of money in his pocket. He didn't have a great big house, and he didn't have a big old Rolls Royce riding around in it. Some of these guys.
guys on television begging you for money. You find out, you look and find out, they got a Bentley and a Rolls Royce, and they got a Hummer, and they got blah, blah, blah. They got 10 or 15 cars. They got a mansion. They're going, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And it's not just preachers. Some of them are politicians. Tell me they're for you. They're all for you and all taking care of you. You go look and find out they're living in, in, in communes and living in things where they're being protected by guards 24 hours a day. And everything's handed to them. And they're taking you looking out for you where you can sometimes can't even make it in the grocery store because the things have gotten so high. But don't allow circumstances to dictate. What do you teach me through this now? God, it hurts. It hurts bad. There's one thing the funeral homes would call me for, and, and it's not a claim to fame. It's not something I want to do. It's not something that, that, that I can't wait to do. It's dreadful. But when they get somebody in there that's lost a child, and they don't know who to call or don't have a pastor, they call me. And they always preface it with, this man lost his daughter. He understands the pain.
prayed with her. And then I handed her, held up the, held up the bracelet and said, remember, baby, God's got this. And the very last thing I could say to her that she could respond to was, God's got this. Every time we minister, my wife and I had a chance to minister to somebody, all I can think about is right there at the end, with all that faith that we have, the circumstances were overwhelming. And she said, Dad, I think I'm scared. And when I said with families, I know they're scared. I know there's things going on there that are beyond their control, beyond their circumstances, beyond their thoughts.